All right, everyone, my clock shows six o'clock. So we'll get started with our webinar tonight. Um, first off, thank you so much for joining us. You are um, with the Nevada Department of Wildlife Conservation Education Team. And tonight we're here to talk about urban wildlife. Um, so we are doing this through Zoom. We cannot see or hear you, uh, but if you do have any questions, um, we do have the question and answer box open, so you can throw those in there. You can access it by taking your little mouse and scrolling to the bottom of the screen. And then we'll also be using the chat box tonight. Um, so feel free to use that if you have any comments or want to interact with us um, when it comes to the questions that we present to you. And uh, one of us will be in there responding back as well as um, kind of reading off those answers for us tonight. When you do use the um, chat box, just make sure that you put it to all attendees and um, panelists. I believe it should be everyone if you do that um, so that everyone can see your answers. So tonight we are talking about what is urban wildlife? Um, so I am Jess Wolf, and I am the Urban Wildlife Coordinator for the Western Region. And tonight we have Lauren with us. Lauren. Oops, and I'm muted. Hey, everyone. I'm Lauren McLeod, and I am the Urban Wildlife Coordinator for the Southern Region out of the Las Vegas area. Perfect. Thank you. So we've got both of our main regions um, covered, and then we also do work with um, the Elko Region and the Eastern Region as well. So first we wanted to get to know about what is in your backyard. So in the chat, what are some of the animals that you have seen in your backyard? So we've got coyote, absolutely. Those are kind of all over the place here in Nevada. Bunnies, absolutely. Costa's hummingbird this morning, oh, that's awesome. Coyotes, rabbits, skunks, squirrels, perfect. Any other fun birds? I've seen some dark-eyed juncos recently in my backyard. Quail, awesome. So we definitely have a bunch of different um, animals that like to live in our backyards, and there's a few reasons for that. So first, animals live near humans and really everywhere because of habitat. And there are four main things um, that all animals need in order to survive. So the first thing is food. We all need something to eat. They also all need something to drink. So water, I've got mine right here. They also need a place for shelter and also plenty of space. And a lot of times animals can find access to these resources in and around our neighborhoods because we provide a lot of these resources for them. And sometimes you can find animals using resources that might surprise you. Oftentimes we get calls of there's a duck in my pool or something like that and it's a, it's a water source so they'll certainly use anything that they can find. Um, so one thing that we do as humans that you'll, you'll notice animals taking advantage of are food resources. So oftentimes we feed birds, which is super fun. We get to see lots of cool birds like white crowned sparrows, but those bird feeders, they're not only gonna feed the beautiful songbirds that we love, but they'll also feed lots of other animals. Rodents can be attracted to the fallen bird seed. Um, animals can be attracted to those small birds if they eat birds like hawks um, or coyotes and bobcats. And even bears can be attracted by bird feeders. Uh, Bird baths are another big one. We live in one of the driest states. We don't have access to a lot of water. So when you're putting out uh, bird baths, you're certainly attracting lots of animals because that's an extra water resource that they might not have um, in their kind of outskirt environment where they might be trying to live. Also bird baths are not only going to attract birds to bathe in, but they might attract birds that might eat smaller birds like this hawk right here. Homes and structured buildings um, that we build also will attract lots of different animals. 
Right here, we have some sparrows that have built a nest on the outside of a house. And this is super common. Cliff sparrows, they'll, they'll use the sides of buildings in order to kind of act like a cliff when they might not have ready access out in wildland spaces or when we've encroached it in their areas. Other examples of animals using our houses are um, bats using our attics um, as little places to hang out and roost during the day. Um, Animals like raccoons and skunks, they will use the decks, um, underneath the decks as little places to den at night or during the day as well. Uh, and they'll just use lots of different resources that we have around our house. Pools, again, are another one. Um, ducks certainly will utilize pools, um, thinking that it's a nice little pond that maybe they can have their young um, and have a nice safe environment to, to live in. Well, when a duck a uh, nest near a pool, it's not necessarily the greatest thing because there aren't a lot of food resources in the area, right? A pond has lots of food um, for a duck and her ducklings to survive off of. But when they live near a pool, it's a really clean area that doesn't have a lot of food resources for them. So it's not something we like to encourage. Um, and plus it makes your pool a little gross, but they'll try and find a place where there is a pool um, as a water resource. Uh, wood piles as well will attract little rodents and things like that that like to hunker down and shelter in them. And here are just a few examples that I've received over the past few years of animals living where you might not think they would. Um, so the first three are bobcats hanging out in backyards and bobcats are carnivores, but one of their favorite foods is rabbits. Uh, one study found that bobcats will actually eat about 60% of their diet is rabbits. So our backyards, when they have these nice, big, beautiful green grass, that's going to attract those rabbits into the area, um, which will attract what eats a rabbit, which is a bobcat. Uh, they also uh, will like to hang out near areas where there's maybe a lot of backyard chickens. That's another easy food resource that they can find um, that we don't like them to have, but it will attract them into the area because maybe they could get a free easy meal. Another one that was kind of surprising right here is a little female sage grouse. She's actually down in South Reno and she's been hanging out for about a year or so, living the life up in a suburban neighborhood, um, which is quite surprising because typically we're finding them where there's lots of sagebrush. So something uh, that has become a big question among researchers in the world of urban wildlife is have we molded a new kind of city dweller? So thinking about how our urban areas have expanded over the last decades, you know, more and more wildlife are adapting to these new forms of habitat that Jess was just describing. And so they've coined the term, this is a pretty new term, it's called sin urbanization. This is essentially it's a way to describe the adaptation of wildlife to urban environments. And, you know, right now it's hard to say if it's happening on an evolutionary scale with genetic changes, you know, but what we do know is that these modified behaviors are being observed through entire populations of animals, and they can even be seen over multiple generations. And these behaviors are actually distinctly different from those same animals that are found in wild and rural environments. So some of the things that we've seen changing, you know, some of these pictures might be familiar to you. You've probably seen animals in funny urban scenarios, even some of those previous photos that Jess was able to share as well. They are adapting their behaviors and changing their behaviors in different ways to get used to these different habitats. And as a result, we are seeing general differences and trends in these animals as well. Uh, one of them is seen in many urban animals as higher population densities. So, you know, in urban areas where food sources are available in more concentrated areas, uh, this means that more animals are going to cluster together in those small areas. And a more constant food supply can even lead to higher reproductive rates, and that can affect those population densities too. So, for example, birds. They might have earlier lay dates, or maybe they'll have larger clutch sizes or lay more eggs, uh, or have higher hatchling and fledging successes with their babies as well. And so as a result, we're gonna see those higher populations in those smaller areas. 
And uh, we can also see reduced migratory behavior in some of those animals like birds that do migrate seasonally. Uh, you know, if they have a constant supply of food somewhere, whether that's from handouts or from non-native plants that provide a food source in certain areas where, which normally wouldn't have a growing season for them, they're gonna stick around. You know, any animal just like us, we want easy access to resources. So if they don't have to work hard for that food, they're not gonna wanna work hard. So if they don't feel like they need to move, they might reduce that migratory behavior. Um, we'll see longer breeding seasons too. And this kind of goes along with that higher population density. So if animals have that abundant supply of food, they will feel fit, they'll feel reproductively fit to have longer breeding seasons, maybe outside of that normal window of breeding as well. Uh, and it can also have changes in the circadian rhythm. So that's essentially our internal clock that tells us when to sleep. And it's based on the sun cycles and the moon cycles. So we have it as humans too, all animals have this. It's biologically innate. Uh, but if you think about artificial light sources, those sorts of things can throw off that rhythm a little bit. Uh, you know, animals exposed to high levels of light at times that are normally dark can have changes in hormones and activity patterns. This can also have changes in us too, uh, which is, you know, it's important for even us to have those dark periods so that we can re-energize during those dark hours as well. And so again, this can affect maybe the times of day that they choose to forage or reproduce and can have effects in that way. Uh, and have changing in feeding behavior too. So that kind of ties in with all of these as well. They might go for more unnatural food sources that normally they wouldn't go for in a wild environment, you know, or they might go for those specific food sources that normally during that season, they'd be going for something else. And so we're gonna get into uh, a few different animals that you know researchers have studied and things that we've probably noticed in our own backyards or environments too and to how these behaviors might be altered in those rural versus city environments. So the first would be our uh, dear friend the coyote. I know a lot of us have probably seen coyotes in some of our city environments. Uh, something we've noticed in coyote behavior is typically they'll exhibit more nocturnal behavior in urban environments. So they're more active during the nighttime hours when in wild environments, you'll actually see their activity primarily during the daytime or dawn and dusk hours of the uh, sunset and sun, sunrise times of day. But during uh, activity in the urban environments where humans are around, you know, we do act as a threat to them in most situations. And so they wanna keep their space from us by doing their activity in those nighttime hours where they're less threatened. Uh, and there was some research done in New York City. They've been uh, doing some studies on coyotes in the New York City area for quite a bit now and have put tracking collars on some of the coyotes and have actually noticed that coyotes have begun, those that they are tracking with video tracking collars they will actually look before they cross the street. And so they are learning traffic patterns in urban environments. That is not something that they need to learn in a wild environment at all. This is specifically a behavior that is changing in those coyotes there is a result of an urbanized habitat that they're living in. Uh, raccoons too. So raccoons are definitely friends to our urban environments. They'll use the drainage systems as little highways. So you may notice that you'll see them around those wet environments. Not only does that provide them a water source, but it provides them a way to transport themselves from one area to the other. And you know, even in the Southern Nevada area where our city is intertwined with a series of canals that drain all of our water and recycle it, other animals use that as a form of a highway too. It's a perfect resource for them to use to get from one place to the other safely. And uh, I do wanna share another study with raccoons as well. This was done in Toronto and it actually studied uh, a raccoon's ability to pry the lid off garbage cans that were sealed with bungee cords. And so they did this study on numerous raccoons that were adapted to urban environments and compared it to the abilities of raccoons to do the same task that lived in rural environments or wild environments. And uh, none of the rural raccoons could open the trash bin that was secured with the bungee cord 
but 80% of the city raccoons could, you know, and this just shows that these animals, they want food and water and shelter and space just as much as the next one, just as much as we all need that to survive. And so they are gonna find those different ways to be able to get those resources. Um, and sparrows, this is another example and many songbirds too. I mean, they're definitely well seen throughout our urban environments. Some have been observed to adjust the frequency of their calls in response to noise pollution. So if sparrows are living in an area with high levels of construction and machinery and other loud noises, for them to be able to get their communication across to one another, whether that's doing their roll calls, reproductive calls, mating calls, anything like that, they need to be able to transmit that message. And so they are actually found that to sing at higher pitches in cities so that they would be able to communicate with one another over that noise pollution. And in rural and wild environments, they'll sing at those lower pitches because they don't need to reach those same high notes that they do to get the message across uh, in those urban environments. And this is just uh, a graph from the study that was studying uh, tits in the area, in an urban area to measure the amplitude of artificial noise versus the frequency of those birds that were communicating. And there is a pretty direct correlation with the amplitude of artificial noise and the frequency rising of their calls as well. Uh, and something else to keep in mind, and this is especially true in our urban environments, you know, as I discussed just moments ago about uh, altered migration. And so when birds, they'll, if they have a ready access to any food supply, they may delay their migration or they may not migrate at all if those resources are plentiful. And, you know, although this is great for them in a short term scenario, it provides them food, they're well fed, it can lead to some consequences depending on the environments as well. So, you know, migration is important. It is, you know, there is a reason that these birds do this. Some birds, if they stay in an environment that typically gets cold in the winter, but they stick around because there's always food there, they may struggle to survive when those temperatures drop below comfort. And at that point, it might be too late for them to migrate comfortably and vice versa too with our really warm temperatures in the summer months. So eliminating any handouts to waterfowl at urban ponds is really helpful to keeping some of that migration on track. Perfect, thanks Lauren. Um, so what's around? Um, often we really don't see wildlife that is around because some of them are nocturnal, some of them shift their behaviors, um, but it really doesn't mean that they aren't there. Um, and there's lots of different ways that we could recognize wildlife that's maybe in our neighborhood or hanging out in our backyards. We could see things like nesting materials or nests, nests being built, scat, tracks, and a lot of times we might not see any of these things, but we might be able to hear them. Kind of like the case of the coyote, like Lauren mentioned, um, they shift their behavior to be more nocturnal um, in urban areas. So a lot of times we don't see them because they're most active at nighttime, but a lot of times we can hear them. So now we are going to play a little game. It is called, what kind of scat is that? So we are going to be using the chat um, and I'm going to show you a picture. And if you want to just type in the chat your best guess um, as to who, what kind of animal the scat belongs to, uh, we'll see how you guys do. So here is our first scat. What kind of animal do you think this belongs to? Got one vote for coyote. Any other guesses? Oh, another coyote. Okay, okay. Anyone else wanna play along? I love this game. Thank you. <laughs> bobcat, bobcat. Okay. Perfect. Well, the first two answers were correct. This is from a coyote. Um, so coyote scat is up to four inches long 
and can be about three fourths of an inch in diameter. And it's a very rope-like uh, scat. And oftentimes it's filled with things uh, like fur and bones of animals that they've eaten. Their tracks look like the tracks of medium-sized dogs and they'll typically show some nails in there. Um, and they're found really all across Nevada in many different habitats, including our backyards. And they're really amazing at living near humans. Um, at the beginning of everything shutting down, uh, there was a picture of a coyote actually down on the Las Vegas Strip, in the middle of Las Vegas, on the Strip, just hanging out. Um, so they're certainly really good at living near humans. And they're opportunistic omnivores, so they'll eat just about anything, and that really plays into their ability to be flexible with their habitat. And they also do have a lot of vocalizations, and these vocalizations are uh, really useful for communicating with um, each other in the pack. All right, next scat. What kind of scat is that? If you look really closely, you might be able to see clues as to what their diet might be. I see two guesses, bobcat, fox. Who would have thought you'd be spending tonight taking a close look at poop? <laughs> it's the best way to spend a night, <laughs> but I'm a little weird, so. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> bobcat, ooh. Owl. So I like all those guesses. They all uh, indicate diet pretty well. Totally. Absolutely. Uh, this was totally a bobcat poop. Um, they're about the same size as a coyote um, scat. They're up to four inches long. And again, that three fourths of an inch in diam diameter. But instead of being rope like, they're actually segmented and they have blunt ends. Um, whereas the the coyote scat was a little bit different. Um, so just like our cats at home, they don't have nail marks in their, their paw prints typically. Um, and they're found across many different habitats across the state. Um, and they are different in, than coyotes in that they are carnivores instead of omnivores. So they're really gonna be going after those rodents and rabbits and birds. So here is another animal that we have in Nevada, uh, the mountain lion. And their scat and tracks look a lot like a bobcat's, but it's a lot bigger because it's a much larger animal. Uh, so their scat can be up to five inches in length and one and a quarter inch in diameter. Just like the bobcat, they have segmented um, scat with blunt ends and they can have evidence of whatever was their last meal, um, having bones or fur in, in their scat as well. So mountain lions are really found all over Nevada. Um, one rule of thumb I like to go by is if there are mules here, there can certainly be mountain lions in the area, but they are super, super secretive and they're not often found in urban areas. They really don't want to be near us. A study uh, that came out from UC Santa Cruz actually put um, like little radios near uh, feeding sites for mountain lions. And in one part of the study, they played sounds of humans and the other one sounds of frogs, so sounds of nature. And about 83% of the time when the mountain lions heard, just heard humans, they fled immediately. And it also um, took them longer to return to that food site and it reduced the feeding time. So the time that they wanted to spend in the area. So they're very secretive. They do not want to typically be around us um, and they're big, big, big cats. All right, what kind of scat is that? We have a bear guess. Good guess, it is an omnivore. I just gave it away, sorry. <laughs> So this is a, a raccoon. Uh, so the, the tubes of the raccoon, they're about two to three inches long. They're dark and tubular. 
Um, and what's inside of their scat can vary depending on their diet because raccoons are omnivores and they're very opportunistic. So they'll, they'll kind of get into a lot of different foods. Um, and often their scat has pieces of undigested food kind of visible within it. Their scat can be found in latrines where a lot of that, there will be a lot of poop there. Um, and their tracks look like little hands. I think they're, they're super cute. You can see their tracks down here. Um, so their front paws are about three inches um, and their back are about four. And they can be found across the US and they also live very happily near humans. Um, typically they're found in like wetter areas. We have, well, we get lots of reports of them up here in the Reno area, um, but they can still live down in Southern Nevada as well. Here is another uh, frequent urban animal that we have in Nevada. This is the striped skunk. Uh, just like the raccoon, they do like to live in areas where there's more moisture. Um, typically you'll find a striped skunk within two, about two miles of a, a water source. So their scat um, is about two, one to two inches long, uh, tubular and has those blunt ends. And again, just like the raccoon, there's often evidence of undigested food in there. Um, and while they do eat, uh, they're omnivores, so they'll eat a bunch of different things. One of their favorite foods in the spring and summertime are actually insects. And their scat is often compared to cat scat. And again, they're very widely spread, just, just like raccoons. And I think this is the last scat that you will have to look at tonight. What kind of scat is this? Think of waterways. Oop, we got a goose. Any other Any guesses? Other <laughs> well, the goose answer was totally cor correct. This is from a Canada goose. Um, so their scat can be up to three and a half inches long, and it's usually in a cord shape. It's often that lovely greenish color and coated with a white nitrogen deposits on it. If you live near a golf course or a urban park, you'll often find lots of this and maybe be unfortunate to get it all over your shoes. <laughs> um, their tracks show three of their four toes and they are webbed because they are waterfowl. And they can be found in many different habitats across the United States. They are migratory um, and they do stop by a lot of our urban ponds um, during that migration to take a little bit of a break. But we also do have populations that stay year round. Um, so those are resident populations. And one bird can poop two pounds per day. It's a lot of poop. And I'm sure that many of us have found all of that poop, like I said, in our golf courses and our urban parks. And then, of course, we do have rodents in Nevada. Um, so there are uh, mice and rats that we have frequenting our urban areas. I know um, I find mice droppings in my garage sometimes. It's not my favorite day when that happens. Uh, but mouse droppings are about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch long. And they're smooth and they have those pointed ends. And then there are two types of uh, rats that frequent urban areas. That's the Norway rat and the roof rat. And their scat looks pretty similar to me, um, but to the trained eye that is not mine, they look different. Um, the, they can be anywhere from a half an inch to three quarters, of, three quarters of an inch long. And the Norway rat, they have brown scat um, and it's more blunted on the ends. And the roof rat has a dark scat that has more points at the end. Um, but it's usually a good idea to find a trained professional to look at the the rat scat. And an important thing to understand with all of this wildlife, especially that wildlife that we might be seeing in our own backyards in our state of Nevada, is how can we get along with these neighbors of ours? You know, they have to adapt to this changing habitat that surrounds them just as we adapt to our urban environment. So understanding how we can coexist with this wildlife is so important to making sure that 
we're happy in our own yards and can appreciate the outdoor spaces and that they are also happy in a comfortable and natural habitat as well. And so a big thing, especially when it comes to conflicts with wildlife, it's really important to first and foremost, just understand the behavior of these animals. You know, simple things like being able to identify scat, you know, identify different poop you might find in your yard to know exactly what kind of animals are in your yard. Uh, it's a really great way to really see and understand the behavior of these animals to know how we can coexist with them. So one thing we can do, and this especially pertains to any conflicts that you might be having with certain species of wildlife in your area, in your neighborhood, is making sure to remove attractants. And you know, be mindful that it might be really, really cute to see a bunny chewing on a marigold in your yard, but anything that's attracting one kind of animal will inevitably create a possibility to attract another kind of animal too. And so this goes with really any wildlife, just making sure that you're considering that general food web when you're considering what sort of wildlife you might be attracting. So even, you know, bird feeders that might be attracting other animals as well. And fallen fruit too, if you have fruit trees in your yard, just making sure that you pick up that ripe fruit when it's ready to be picked up because otherwise there might be another animal that want, might want to eat it before you get to it too. And um, water features and landscaping, you know, be mindful of how we're using these. I know, especially in our Southern region, uh, we definitely want water features where it's a little bit less frequently found in natural environments, but animals understand that too. And if they see an irrigation system or a bird bath, or any sort of water source, you know, they might want to make use of that as well. So just be mindful of that habitat that you're creating. And this goes for landscaping as well. So any vegetation that you have, if it's well trimmed, it might provide less of a chance for an animal to use that as a habitat. Whereas if you have overgrown vegetation, you're creating a safe space for an animal to take cover in and create a habitat out of as well. Uh, a big thing too is not feeding pets outside. Uh, you know, if you have cats or dogs, making sure that their food is enclosed in a space indoors because leaving pet food outside is leaving food out for any other animal to access it as well. Uh, and this, along with your pet food, making sure that your pets are protected as well. You know, we do know that in any wild environment, there are predators and we want to make sure that our pets are absolutely safe from any of those potential predators. So, for example, if you're seeing coyote activity in your neighborhood, you wanna always make sure that you're walking your dog on a leash, you know, in particular a short leash too, that you're able to maintain control of your animal with. And try to early on train your dogs. If you're walking your dogs, train them to, you know, sit when they see something while you're walking them. Make sure that you're able to maintain control of your animal because this keeps them so safe from any potential threats that might be out there. And same goes with your cats too. If you have cats that you, you know, want to get some outdoor time, investing in something or building something like a catio is a really good way to still let them outside, um, but maybe keep them a little bit more protected from potential wildlife that might be in your neighborhoods as well. And it also does help to keep, especially in the spring months, some of our wildlife safe, like those baby birds too. Uh, you know, Absolutely, in the end, always just trying to do what we can to keep wildlife wild. And so seeing things like ducks in our pool might be really neat the first time, but it is a pretty unnatural environment for those ducks. So it's not only unhealthy and unsafe for them, but it can also create a nuisance for us too when we're starting to see those feces buildups and things like that. And you know, a bobcat might be really neat to see in the wild, but it might be a little bit uncomfortable to see one as close as your back porch making use of your lawn chair. So just trying to do what we can to keep wildlife as wild as we can. And you know, one thing that we can do to do this is something called hazing. And hazing is essentially just a way to be bigger and scarier than that animal. So innately animals are threatened by us. You know, we are big scary predators. We are humans and we are a threat to them. But if they get used to us and they see us and we don't do anything to scare them, they start to get a little bit desensitized to us. So they no longer perceive us as a threat. And as soon as they get getting become too comfortable in our yards, that's when they can become a problem. 
And so we wanna make sure when we are seeing animals like coyotes or even ducks, we wanna make sure that we're doing things to scare them off so that they are encouraged to go to habitat where they're more comfortable in and they can get those resources in a more natural environment. And I think, you know, some points just to remember too, and we're doing a very general overview of urban wildlife here tonight. And we will get into a little bit of what the rest of the week looks like at the end of this too, because we're gonna get into way more detail this week throughout the whole week. Uh, but just overall remembering that this habitat, that food, that water, that shelter, that space, this is non-discriminatory. So we can't necessarily pick and choose which kind of wildlife we're going to attract. You know, and we all love seeing wildlife. I know many of us that are joining here, we're joining because we do have some sort of appreciation for wildlife, but understanding that in order to coexist with them, we need to understand their behavior and understand ways that we can manage conflicts with them, especially as it pertains to our own neighborhoods and just keeping wildlife wild. So the best thing that we can do for them and the best thing that we can do for ourselves is to give them their space and eliminate any of those sorts of human conditioning. We want them to live on their natural lives and their natural grounds. And we wanna make sure that we're not having an effect on that because that can also negatively affect us. And uh, of course, just understanding that we do need wildlife because living without wildlife would probably look something like this. And we don't want a, a world like this. We love our flowers and our animals and everything that makes our earth beautiful here. And so we are wrapping up with our side of the talking here tonight, but we would love to open this up to any questions that y'all have. Um, so please feel free to use the Q&A box or that question and answer. You can also use the chat too if you find that a little bit easier and we can go through. And if you have any additional questions on some of our awesome wildlife, we'd love to hear it. And uh, as folks are starting to come up with those questions, I do just, I'm gonna pop over to the next slide just so we can see some of our upcoming webinars for the week. Oh, Jess, you might have to do it. All right, thanks. <laughs> and um, so just so you have this list, these are the webinars that we will be conducting all on urban wildlife this entire week. So please feel free to join us for some of these other ones so we can get into more detail as it pertains to specific animals too. And uh, I do see a question that has not been answered in the Q&A box. Someone said, what flowers do rabbits not like? I would say it can depend. They can be a little non-discriminatory toward flowers. There's definitely some that are good to deter them like marigolds. But as you saw in that last photo, there was a rabbit eating a marigold. Um, so they can become used to certain sources um, but it looks like, oh, do you want to answer that question live? Did it pop up, Jess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I think the thing, um, too, when you are planning out your garden, um, native plant life is always best. So if you are trying to, like, create a nice garden, um, native plant life is usually going to hold up to browsing from different animals a lot better than, um, our ornamental plants, even though they're super, super pretty. <laughs> Yeah. Um, do raccoons attack dogs? It can happen, but it's, it's super, super rare. Um, and to kind of limit any pet kind of coming into contact with a raccoon, they are a nocturnal animal. Um, so trying to keep them inside and, um, and keeping our cats inside or in catios will definitely help cut down on any kind of conflict that way. And I see another question that came up is someone studying diseases in wild animals. So this is actually a very large field of study. We have people right in Endow in the Nevada Department of Wildlife that study this. And there's also the, uh, the Department of Agriculture Animal Disease Lab. And they essentially function to track any diseases that might be in our avian populations, so our bird populations, any viruses that might be going on among the uh, bird populations or they'll track rabies in animals and all sorts of diseases so that we can manage and track those populations, whether you know we are seeing decline in those populations or just generally have an understanding of 
where some of those animals lie on that spectrum as well? That's a great question. Um, the next question is, do you consider the Mustangs wildlife? Um, and so from an agency standpoint, we do not manage the um, horses and they are managed by the Bureau of Land Management as a feral species. So that means um, they're a species that were released by people um, and they've quote unquote gone wild, uh, but we do not consider them to be native wildlife. And then we have another question, what flowers attract hummingbirds? So hummingbirds love the color red. Uh, that's why a lot of hummingbird feeders with, that you put that sugar water mixture into are the color red. They are super attracted to any of those red, deep trumpeted flowers. So there's a lot of native salvias that you can get that come in those purple and red colors that uh, hummingbirds absolutely love. I have one desert salvia that I keep in my yard and I see hummingbirds at it all the time in the spring season. Perfect, thank you. Um, so to avoid human animal conflict, what are examples of things Endow is actively working on? Anything at Nellis Air Force Base what about wildlife crossings, overpasses, and underpasses that mimic their natural habitat? Um, just curious to know what initiatives are taking place to help our urban wildlife. Um, so we do a lot of things. One of the biggest things that we're trying to do is really educate people about the wildlife in their area, because while we can have as many initiatives as we want, if people who are living in urban areas aren't doing the right thing and trying to um, mitigate those conflicts, try to remove those excess resources and learn how to live with wildlife on their own. Um, anything that we can do really wouldn't end up helping. There are things that happen at like airports to try and reduce conflicts uh, with birds and airplanes. Um, like I know the wildlife services up here, they use dogs to scare off uh, geese and things like that um, from the Air Force Base. We also do work to do um, wildlife overpasses. There was one done, oh, I forget the exact year, um, but recently over um, in the Elka region to give deer an overpass um, from one of their main corridors. Do you have any other ones that we're working on, Lauren? No, oh, I think that's, yeah, those are all, that's all great input. I know, yeah, here we've definitely, we have a, a wildlife corridor that goes one of our over one of our highways by the Hoover Dam too. If you're ever driving along uh, the 93, 95 as it would be coming down there, uh, you can see one of our wildlife crossings there as well. Uh, and that's a really great way to make up for you know any habitat that we might have defragmented from urbanization. And I see the next question is: Do coyotes attack people? And that is a great question. Uh, and you know, especially if any of y'all are interested in learning more about coyotes as they are living in our urban environments, we do have a webinar all about just coyotes. It's on February 24th, it's at noon on the 24th. Uh, and you can also look at our YouTube page too, which has videos on very similar webinars. Uh, essentially, when it comes to coyote tax on people, it is so uncommon. Uh, in the state of Nevada, and I'm not sure how uh, what the updated stats are. I know I've pulled up information over a 20 year period that I think was conducted and ended in 2006. And over that 20 year period, there were, it was like four or five attacks on people. And all of those attacks, like anytime that we see aggression from coyotes toward people, it's almost always a result of being hand fed by those humans. So it's animals that become food conditioned and then all of a sudden they're directly associating our hands with a food source. You know, it's that reason is definitely the primary one. Or secondly, if you have a pet dog that you're walking and if, you know, if you don't have good control over your pet and if they engage in a fight with a coyote, uh, you know, aggression has occurred with humans trying to break up those fights in any sort. So I would say on a general basis though, that it's definitely not something we have to worry about. The big concern is just ensuring that no one is ever feeding coyotes because that's when we do see aggression in any animal really. Anytime they start to become associated with food for human, from humans, then that's when we see that unnatural aggressive behavior. And that's a great question, thanks. Just another reason not feed the wildlife, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we have another coyote related question. What is the best 
fencing for coyote deterrents like barbed wire or electric fencing. Um, so from my experience, the best fence is a fence that is six to seven feet tall and then has um, coyote rollers on top. And coyote rollers are like a, a roller that you can get. They have um, companies that build them themselves or there are DIY options on the web. Um, but basically what it does is it makes it so the coyote can't get a grip on the top of the fence and continue their journey over the fence um, into your backyard. So coyote rollers and a nice tall fence are a really good option. But um, again, like Lauren said, that living with coyotes webinar on the 24th will give you lots of information. And we even have one already up on our YouTube channel um, that you can kind of find some more information on living with coyotes. And the next question is COVID-19 found in any Nevada animals? Uh, as far as, and just interrupt me if I'm incorrect, as far as I know, no. I mean, I know in general, there have been cases of COVID found in folks' pet dogs. I don't think anyone, any dog in Nevada. Uh, I know it is definitely a topic of study, primarily conducted with the Department of Agriculture would be sort of the one spearheading that sort of project but there hasn't been any known transmission of COVID from animal to human that we're aware of. Um, so I don't think it's a huge concern. Uh, and Jess, if you have anything to add to that too, but I would definitely, I would resort to uh, contacting or looking into the Department of Agriculture because they always have the most updated information on that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I haven't heard of any um, examples in Nevada. I know that we are particularly concerned about um, like mink and river otters because there was that big outbreak at that um, place. I forget where it was at, but uh, yeah, nothing that has been confirmed. Um, I think this might be better answered by you, Lauren, since you did the, the research on this part, um, but I can read it off. Uh, so with the songbirds that sing in higher frequencies within city limits, did that study compare if urban and rural birds can still communicate? It's great that they can adapt. Just curious if that has had any implications in their communication along um, edge habitats and the like. That is such a good question. I'm actually, I'm gonna put the, I have the link open to the study that was conducted on this. I know this, the specific study that I was looking at is just one of many that have been done. Um, the chart that I had displayed in the PowerPoint was from a Dutch city that had conducted this with some of their song sparrows there. But I'll, uh, I'll pop that link to the article that I pulled that chart from so you have that available into the chat because I don't know. And that's a super great question and it might have information in there for you because I can't imagine. And I think, you know, that's the big root of folks and researchers studying sin urbanization, sin urbanization is to see if there actually will be these genetic evolutionary changes over time. And I think since the research is still so novel, it's it's hard to say whether this is going to have any long-term evolutionary changes. Um, but that is, yeah, that's a great question. I'll pop that in the link right now, or in the chat right now. Awesome, and then the final question that I have open, um, is there a chart with the different types of scat? Um, so there are lots of different resources for trying to identify scat. Um, Places like REI or bookstores, sometimes they have like these cool fold out brochures that are all laminated that you can get that have a bunch of different types of scat on it um, or some field guides. I have one that's really thick that I wouldn't ever wanna take out on a hike with me, but it has all the different types of tracks and scat that you can find in North America. Um, so if you just look up like scat book or a scat brochure, there should be a ton of resources that you can find um, to, to get you some of that information. Lauren, do you have a favorite? I have, I keep this by my desk. I don't know, you can't see with my background, but I have a scat and tracks field guide and I am guilty of taking this on hikes with me. I'm, I'm the friend that stops at every pile of poop I see because I want to know what animals have been around. Uh, but I find it to be a super useful resource, you know, especially in desert environments where you may not see, actively see wildlife as often. Um, because they're hiding in burrows or elsewhere, trying to get away from the heat or cold. Uh, being able to see signs of them being there previously is a really cool way to connect with some of that wildlife out there. 
Totally. I am that person because mine is like literally a textbook. I usually am there with like my camera and taking pictures and I'm like, okay, so it's about the size of my pinky finger (laughs) and go from there. Um, Well, awesome. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, This was super, super fun. I hope that you can all join us um, for some of our other presentations that we have uh, this week. And if you do miss any of them, no worries. We will be recording them and uploading them to our YouTube page. um, So you can always go back. Or if you just liked it so much and you want to listen again, we love that too. Um, So definitely join us for some of the upcoming ones. And if you go to bed tonight and you wake up and you have this burning question about wildlife, you can always feel free to reach out to us and we're always happy to try and answer your question or try and help you find the answer. And with that, I think we can end this webinar. Yeah, thank you everyone so much for joining. And uh, that link is in the chat too, if you wanted to grab it. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.